Good morning, class. Today is day 28 of Corona Chem. And today we're going to talk about photo dissociation and the power of the sun. This is uh, period one, of course, for grade 11 and 12C. So what is photo dissociation? Photo dissociation is a phenomenon that occurs in the upper atmosphere. So at very high altitudes, uh, the atmosphere is very thin and the sun's rays are at their full power because they haven't been filtered through anything. They've traversed the distance between the surface of the sun and the earth, which is about 93 million miles on average because the earth does vary in its distance from the sun as it orbits the sun. And paradoxically, the, s the earth is usually closer to the sun in the wintertime and further in the summer, which is an interesting observation. So why is the summer warmer? Well, there are other factors that affect the, um, the energy reaching the surface of the earth, and that is the tilt of the earth. In the summertime, the northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun at a 23 degree angle. So the rays reach the earth uh, more directly in the summer months. For those three months, the earth is tilted forward towards the sun. And in the three winter months, the, the northern hemisphere is tilted away from the sun at a 23 degree angle. So that creates a, a weaker sunlight. We don't really notice the difference, but it, it is sufficient to make those temperature changes. Anyway, with regards to photo dissociation, a lot of the sun's electromagnetic spectrum is actually uh, incompatible with life. If, you, uh, if we didn't have an atmosphere, the intense UV radiation emitted from the sun would kill everything on the surface of the Earth. But strong UV light present at high altitudes is known to rupture bonds in molecules. Oxygen... Um, I think I, forget, I forgot to finish my sentence here. Oxygen undergoes at 400 kilometers altitude uh, this, this process of bond rupture because of the strong UV radiation that can hit it. At 130 kilometers altitude, uh, there's about a 50-50 ratio of monatomic and diatomic oxygen. As you know, oxygen is usually a diatomic molecule, but if a photon of sufficient energy hits that bond, it can cause the bond to rupture and you get what's called a radical mechanism. You don't get a charge on the oxygen atom, but what you get is uh, a, a single unpaired electron bonding to one oxygen and the other one bonding to the other oxygen, so that what was formerly a shared bond is now split down the middle. So you get what's called monatomic oxygen, which is quite reactive, but in the meantime, it has absorbed that photon of energy, which if it hit something on the surface of the Earth, it would uh, cause damage. So this shield of atoms at the upper reaches of the atmosphere absorb the, the harmful part of the sun's radiation. On practice example page uh, 773 of your text, uh, it says the bond energy of nitrogen is 941 kilojoules per mole. It's a triple bond, right? Nitrogen is a triple bond. So it's a, it's a bond that's hard to break and it, it absorbs a lot of energy before it breaks. And it says, what is the longest wavelength a photon can have and still have sufficient energy to dissociate nitrogen? Uh, I started a calculation by converting 941 kilojoules per mole into joules per mole. So I, we know there's 1,000 joules per kilojoule. So that gives you 941,000 joules per one mole of nitrogen atoms. And then we found out how many atoms there are in one mole. It's uh, Navogadro's number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23 molecules per one mole. So that means that for every single atom, it takes that many joules to break the bond. 1.56 times 10 to the negative 18 joules per one molecule. And then I used an equation that you learn in chapter six, which you haven't taken yet, but just take my word for it. The energy of a photon is related to a constant called Planck's constant represented by this letter H, times the frequency of the wavelength. So they ask us to find out what the wavelength is. The, 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 short, the longest wavelength, meaning the least energy possible, that could still break this, that will have this much energy, so that it can break this bond. So we rearrange the equation to solve for the frequency, 
here's the energy content of the bond, the energy necessary to break the bond, here's Planck's constant, which has units of joules times second, and I have no room to put it here, it's J times S, joules times second, and the answer ends up over here, 2.35 times 10 to the 15 hertz, that's the frequency of the photon necessary to break that bond, and let's now calculate uh, what the wavelength is, and you'll see that it ends up in the ultraviolet range. Normally, our eyes can see photons between 400 and 700 nanometers in length. We actually see a very small part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Our eyes can only see from about 400 to about 700, 750, from, from, and we see that as ultra, from violet all the way to red. You know, the, rain, the colors of the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And beyond that, there's still photons, we just don't see them. Bees can see some ultraviolet light, so bees see patterns in flowers that we don't. That's perhaps one of the ways they can discern which flowers contain nectar. And then, on the other end of the spectrum, we can't see light that's longer in wavelength than red. We can't, we can't see into the infrared, but there are animals that can see into the infrared. Pit vipers, for example, can see into the infrared, so they can see the heat sh signature, say, of a mouse scurrying by in an otherwise totally darkened room. So they've got night vision, so it's kind of a scary thing, but it's perhaps necessary for something like a predator, like a viper. Anyway, to finish the question, uh, since lambda, the wavelength of light, times the frequency of the light equals the speed of light, so let me just put that down for you, where lambda equals wavelength in meters, and mu is the frequency of the light, and if you multiply the wavelength times the frequency, you get the speed of light. And the speed of light is uh, 186,282 miles per second, or it's about 300,000 kilometers per second. Even at that speed, it takes about eight minutes for a ray of light leaving the surface of the sun to reach the earth. Eight minutes. So if the sun were to suddenly turn off, we wouldn't see it turn off till eight minutes later because the, the light that had already been emitted would still be coming towards us. Kind of a freaky thought. Uh, if we want to find the wavelength, we rearrange the equation to C over mu, and then we plug in the numbers. The speed of light, well, I got it more exactly here because I got it out of the calculator, 2.997. Nine, that's, it rounds out to about 300,000 times 10 to the 8 meters per second divided by the frequency we found out in the previous calculation, which I just erased because there's no room otherwise, times 10 to the 15 uh, seconds to the minus 1 is the units of hertz. And so the wavelength turns out to be 100 at uh, 1.27 one. 2 times 10 to the, sorry, times 10 to the minus 7 meters. And we, if we convert that to nanometers, times 10 to the 9 nanometers per 1 meter, you get 127 nanometers. Remember, I told you the visible range is between 400 and 750 nanometers. Okay, this is 127. So this is way below our visible range of light. It's a, it's a hard ultraviolet light. So if, I mean, if you took your shirt off at uh, 400 kilometers altitude, you could get exposure to that kind of ultraviolet light, but uh, you'd get beyond a sunburn. You, you would cook your skin off in a, in a few minutes probably or less because of the intense uh, UV radiation. You'll notice that when the astronauts went to the surface of the moon, they had special visors on their suits that were, ex were reflected. They had a, whenever the sun was visible, if they were turned towards the sun, they would put the visor down because that intense light is uh, probably harmful for your eyes. Although probably it doesn't go through the glass that they used as the primary layer of their, their spacesuits. But, because there's no, there's no air on the moon, there's no protection from these extreme UV rays. So you can't, you can't just expose your, it's not as though you could go, uh, suppose there was an atmosphere on the moon, you couldn't just expose yourself uh, 
even if say they had, one day in the future they build an artificial atmosphere, uh, let's say they built a dome on the on the moon, you would have to make sure that that dome could filter out UV light. I think glass filters out UV light, so that wouldn't be a problem, but it's not something you want to take a risk with. So this idea of photoionization is the explanation for uh, the fact that satellites orbiting at high altitude experience high levels of corrosion because the monatomic oxygen that exists at those high altitudes is uh, will actually scour metals. It's a very reactive species and it, it can cause a, a rapid deterioration of metal surfaces. And uh, fortunately, the concentrations of air at those altitudes are extremely low, but the air that you do find is quite uh, corrosive. Also, it goes without saying that if you breathed in monatomic oxygen, it would kill you. We, we need diatomic oxygen to survive, not monatomic oxygen. I just want to pause that for now uh, with regard to the... Um, the subject of photoionization, and I want to present the question to you. And the question is this, could we calculate how powerful the sun is? Could we, based on the information we do have, calculate, say, how many horsepower the sun is? And the answer is yes, and I'll show you how. We know from research that on a sunny day, The Earth, obviously a cloudless day, the Earth receives about 1,350 watts per square meter. On a, on a sunny day with no clouds, you get 1,350 watts of energy hitting the surface of the Earth per square meter. The Earth is on the average 93 million miles from the Sun. How much, let's make, this, let's make this fun, how much horsepower is the sun emitting based on these, uh, based on these uh, data? Well, the answer is this. Let's pretend the earth, let's pretend the sun was inside a giant sphere that absorbed all of its energy. All right, so at this distance from the sun, 93 million miles, every square meter is receiving 1,350 watts of energy. So if you're 93 million miles away, if you made a sphere that encompassed the entire uh, sun and captured all of the energy emanating from the surface of the sun, uh, you would simply have to calculate the inner surface area of that sphere. Well, we know that the surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. And that sphere, so a sphere, an imaginary sphere, 93 million miles in uh, a radius would have a surface area of 4 pi 93 times 10 to the 6 miles squared. So let's find out how many square miles such a such a, an imaginary sphere would have. So 93 exponent 6 squared gives you 8.64 times 10 to the 15. Multiply that by pi and multiply that by 4 and we have the surface area, the internal surface area of our imaginary sphere that is capturing all the energy that the sun emits. 1.0868 um, times 10 to the 17 miles squared. Now let's take that number and convert it to meters squared because that's the uh, radiant energy that we've been quoted. So 1.086, I'm not going to write the whole number, times 10 to the 17, but sure enough, it's still my calculator, times 10 to the 7 miles squared 
times, we know there's 5,280 feet per one mile, but remember we're dealing with miles squared here, so we're going to have to square the uh, surface area. Then there's 12 inches per one foot, all square, and there's 2.54 centimeters per every inch, exactly, it's a, this is an exact conversion, that's all squared, and there's one meter for every hundred centimeters, and we're going to all square that. Okay, so that we're going to turn that surface area of the sphere into a surface area in meters squared, because that's what we want to multiply it by to find out. So that gives you a surface area of, so times 5280 squared times 12 squared times 2.54 squared uh, div divided 100 squared. Remember, it says times here, but because the number that we're dealing with is in the denominator, the one's not going to do anything. One squared is still one, but the number that we're dealing with that's going to have an effect is in the denominator. So that's a division. So even though it says times this fraction, the important part is in the denominator. So when, you have, when you're multiplying fractions, if you have a one in the numerator and a, a, a some other number in the denominator, you divide. You save the steps. You don't bother entering the ones. They don't do anything. Okay, so what, the, what you get is 2.81496845 times 10 to the 23 meters squared. That's the surface area of an imaginary sphere with a radius of 93 million miles. Now, if every square meter of that sphere is receiving 1,350 watts when the sun is shining, that's going to tell you the total power output of the sun. Meters squared will cancel. So imagine this, this imaginary sphere is catching all the light emitted from the surface of the sun. So we'll multiply by 1,350. And it tells you the wattage of the sun, 3.8002074 times 10 to the 26. Now, I'm keeping all the decimal places because that's what it says in my calculator. And if you try to reproduce the calculation, you're not going to be thrown off by the fact that I'm rounding as I do the calculation. Obviously, these numbers are not perfectly accurate, right? They vary uh, depending on the sun's output because that varies the distance of the Earth from the Sun, the cloudiness, and all the other stuff. But what we're looking for here is the average output of the Sun. That's in watts. Let's turn it into horsepower. We know that one horsepower is 745 watts. So let's divide that by 745, and we'll find out how many horsepower the Sun is. Divided 745 equals 5.1. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to round it because I've run out of room. 5.1 times 10 to the 23 horsepower. The sun is almost a mole of horsepower. Now, if you look it up on uh, Siri, here, you can ask Siri this. You can say, I'm not going to say it because then my phone's going to answer, but ask her how many horsepower the sun is, and you'll see that it comes up to about that number. So that's how powerful the sun is. I'm going to stop lecturing there, but I want to give you some examples of, actually we've only gone for 18 minutes, we can do a little more. I spoke about that, photo dissociation and um, photo ionization. Photoionization is where hard UV radiation at 90 kilometers altitude absorbed by molecules can cause ionization by ejection of an electron. So the minimum wavelength to cause this ranges from around 80 to 135 nanometers. We saw earlier that uh, the hard UV is available in those higher altitudes. You know, we, we can still suffer from alt the effects of high altitude radiation. Uh, if you go to a mountaintop, you get a sunburn a lot more quickly than if you're at sea level because there is uh, more UV radiation as you go, as you climb in altitude. And also the wavelength of the UV radiation that filters down to the surface of the earth tends to be shorter 
as you go higher in altitude because there's less and less intervening atmosphere to protect you from the rays. Something about ozone. Ozone absorbs wavelengths in the 240 to 310 nanometer range. So at an altitude of about 30 to 90 kilometers, molecular oxygen and atomic oxygen can combine to form ozone, which is O3. Ozone is a very reactive molecule. It's so reactive that it can only persist at altitudes where there's very little gas for it to react with. Uh, but if you were to expose most substances to ozone, ozone will attack anything with a double bond and break the double bond and stick an oxygen atom on the end of it. So if you have a, say you have a molecule like, uh, say you had butene, something like this. One, two, three, four. If you had ozone, the butene will literally be cut into, and then you'll get oxygen atoms stuck where the double bond was. So it cleaves the double bond and sticks oxygen atoms on it. The, the reaction is so uh, powerful that they use it to purify water. So you can ozonize water. If you look on your water bottles, very often you'll see ozonized. What it means is they've exposed the water to ozone. You can generate ozone at sea level by uh, electrical, a silent electrical discharge. You could, for the electrical voltage actually gives enough energy for the oxygen atoms to recombine into ozone. So if you expose most chemicals to ozone, if they have a double bond in them, it'll cleave the double bond and put an oxygen atom on the end of it, and it tends to make the molecule smaller, more water soluble, and more and easier for your body to excrete through your kidneys. So that's one of the ways they purify water from any potentially toxic chemicals. If you expose things to ozone, they tend to break down. Rubber breaks down, plastics break down. So ozone at sea level, bad. You don't want any ozone at sea level. That's fortunately why it's, uh, you know, it, it's at 30 kilometers altitude where it protects us from the uh, high intensity UV radiation. And it also tends to last longer at those higher altitudes because there's fewer molecules to bump into. The, uh, so there's fewer reactions taking place that will tend to use up the ozone before it can build up to a, to a significant concentration. But this, is, this brings to light the issue of chlorofluorocarbons, which were discovered to be catalytically degrading the amount of ozone in those higher altitudes. And scientists were saying that there was, there was cause for concern because if you don't have ozone of sufficient concentration in the atmosphere, then those UV rays that normally would be captured by it or absorbed by it are going to filter down to the lower altitudes and you're going to start seeing an increase of uh, skin cancer rates and, and degradation of surfaces that are made of uh, organic chemicals. Uh, the book, the textbook mentions that natural sources of ozone depleting chemicals like volcanic hydrochloric acid are not believed to make it to the required altitude before combining with water. So they're probably neutralized before they reach the higher altitudes. But chlorofluorocarbons are pretty tough chemicals. They resist most chemical degradation or reaction, and, but they do undergo photo dissociation. So once they hit those higher altitudes, the ultraviolet light breaks them down. And that's where they become reactive enough to uh, eat up ozone so anyway, they, they, a bunch of scientists got together in the 90s and they, they did something, they formulated what was called the Montreal Protocol and they banned the use of chlorofluorocarbons, uh, which caused a lot of problems for the heating, ventilation, and uh, what's the AC part? Heating, ventilation, air conditioning, right, HVAC. It caused a lot of problems for the industry that deals with air conditioning because air conditioners use a lot of chlorofluorocarbons to uh, to use as a gas which is easily compressible absorbs heat energy and then when it when it turns back into a gas it releases um, it absorbs more energy because it, it tends to cool so that's what they use as a circulating fluid in an air conditioner but when those air conditioners spring a leak they release these toxic or these these gases which are uh, harmful to the ozone layer so they had to develop uh, compatible substitutes for for the uh, 
the liquid that circulates in the air conditioners that would not degrade the ozone layer. Um, so they've developed new ones. They tend to be more expensive. <coughs> and I don't know how much people comply with them, with these rules. Probably in some countries where the laws are not implemented, they're still using the old, the old uh, aerosols. The next issue will be um, the content of trace gases in the troposphere. But I just want to jump to uh, a numerical problem with you, which is on number 1813. It talks about the, it's a calculation of parts per million concentration of gases. I'll show you how to do that calculation and I'll give you a homework question as well. On 1813 of the text, it says the average concentration of carbon monoxide in air in Dayton, Ohio was 3.4 parts per million in the year 2000. Calculate the number of carbon monoxide molecules in one liter of this air at a pressure of 755 torr and at a temperature of 22 degrees Celsius. Right, so we start off with uh, three point four parts per million out of the I shouldn't say ppm, I should say three hundred three point four parts out of a million parts. That's three point four parts per million. So the pressure is 755 torr uh, times one atmospheric pressure per 760 torr equals, so we've converted it to torr now, to atmosphere, sorry, 3.3776 times 10 to the minus 6 of an atmosphere. That's the pressure of this gas. And if we use PV equals NRT, just like we learned in our last chapter, um, we can rearrange the equation to solve for N. So N, therefore, is equal to PV over RT. And we plug in the pressure in atmospheres, 3.3776 times 10 to the negative 6 of an atmosphere, uh, 1 liter of the gas, and use the gas constant, 0.082057 liter atmospheres per Kelvin mole. And the temperature is 273.15 Kelvin added on to 22 degrees Celsius. So that converts the temperature <coughs> to Kelvin. Liters cancel, atmospheres cancel, Kelvins cancel. So your answer is in moles. And you get N equals 1.394, 6 times 10 to the negative 7 moles. I'm truncating the decimals, but I kept all of them in my cal calculator, times an Avogadro number of molecules per mole gives you that you have 8.3985 times 10 to the 16 molecules. And then you just report it to the right number of sig figs. There's only two allowed. So 8.4 times 10 to the 16 molecules are present in a sample of one liter of that air. For homework tonight, try 1814. It's a similar type of question. It's not exactly the same, but it's close enough that you should be able to figure it out. Okay, and I'll show you what 1814 looks like by flipping the camera. Hopefully it doesn't... No, I can't do that now. Okay, I have to show you. Hopefully it picks it up. So 1819, I did say that, right? No, 1814. So 1814 is this one. Did 
There you go. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow. Oh, and I'll read you the question just in case. It says, from the data in table 18.1, what is the concentration of neon in the atmosphere in parts per million? B, what is the concentration of neon in the atmosphere in molecules per liter, assuming an atmospheric pressure of 743 torr and a temperature of 300 Kelvin? So you don't know table 18.1, so I'm going to show you table 18.1, or I'll, I'll just read the answer off for you for that part, because you don't have access to table 18.1. Neon is present in the atmosphere by mole fraction at a concentration of 0 0.00001818. That's the mole fraction. And the molar mass of neon is 20.183. Let's see if you can solve it. See you tomorrow.